Well, thank you, and I'd really like to thank uh, Gibson Library Connections for for making this possible and 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 remembering uh, Dave Binkley. I'm also uh, when I was reading the the description of this uh, of this lecture, uh, I was very pleased to see that this uh, is one that brings in voices from outside your circle. I didn't realize I was outside your circle, but now that I'm outside. <laughs> Uh, I want in, <laughs> and the reason I want in is because I, I have heard more really good dry jokes at this conference, accompanied often by great slides, than at any other group I know. In fact, uh, Mike and Jacob this morning stole all the jokes I wish I was smart enough to uh, think of, so you don't get any jokes today from me. On October 2nd of 2014, Sargon of Akkad published another one of his short videos in which he focused on a researcher who works on gender and games and the Digital Games Research Association. The description of the video starts with, Degra is the poisoned spring from whence all this evil flows. It needs further investigation. Everyone should investigate them further. This prompted the Gamergate community, a loose but very active community concerned with what they perceived to be biased attacks on video game culture to start Operation Digging Degra. Degra, by the way, is a scholarly association that organizes conferences and has a journal. Pretty tame stuff, a lot like Access. Academics were now the target of attention of Gamergate, a community notorious for legitimizing harassment. Though, of course, that's one of the things they dispute. What was this operation? Well, it involved fact-checking all 700 or so articles in the DIGRA Digital Library of peer-evaluated papers accepted for DIGRA conferences. To do this, Gamergators actually scraped and archived the DIGRA Digital Library. They also started various wiki pages about DIGRA to manage their research. As they put it, this was going to be a long operation. So why do I start with this operation? Well, because it illustrates some of the paradoxes of contemporary digital research and the power of archives. Gamergators were setting out to study the game studies researchers, people like myself, who were studying them, in part to drive them back into the ivory tower, and they were doing it with the tools of the academy, including curated archives. They set out to create and control their own digital archive for documenting the phenomena as they saw it. They didn't trust us. Gamergators saw what they were doing as a form of honest peer review, turning the practices of the academy onto the academy itself. They were going to make us live up to our own standards. Meanwhile, safe in Western Canada, in Edmonton, where it is a wee bit colder, <clears throat> but it's a dry cold. <laughs> a group of us were experimenting with visualizations, trying to find ways to represent too much information, what we called the hairball problem, because all visualizations of too much information end up looking like hairballs. Some of them are very pretty hairballs, but they're still incomprehensible hairballs. We'd adapted a Twitter scraper and grabbed a couple million tweets about Rob Ford. May he rest in peace, but you remember Rob Ford, mayor, then mayor of Toronto, just as things were blowing up, in order to see if we could create better visualizations of the millions of data points uh, that, would, that would communicate more and allow us to explore this, this phenomenon. But it was really visualization that we're, that we're struggling with, and this was one of the prototypes that we, that we built. Not entirely successful. When we realized how important Gamergate was, and how important it could be to the history of, of contemporary gaming, we naively decided to turn our scraper onto the Gamergate hashtag and try to achieve, try to archive some of what was happening so that we could apply digital humanities techniques and visualizations later to its study. Over the months, and we're still, we're still scraping, we've been gathering up to about a million tweets a month. It's now tapered off significantly, but for a while there it was over a million tweets a month. And we now have a growing tech space, uh, which uh, in 2015, we actually realized we need to think through some of the ethical issues around the gathering and archiving of this data, especially since we were uh, 
thinking of proposing papers to the Canadian Game Studies Association and uh, Humanities Computing Association. And this led us to develop a preliminary ethical statement when we published some of our materials through the University of, uh, of Alberta's Dataverse network. Of course, our Dataverse net our archive was soon noticed by the Gamergators beca and became very quickly U of A's most popular Dataverse network. I think it still is. I, I, I didn't check today, but the last time I checked it was. Uh, even though very little of what we put up you could download. We'd embargoed most of the materials and only uh, made available the sort of summary materials. But the Gamer Gators quickly used what we had put up to once again prove that the movement was not about the harassment of women, but about game media ethics, something we didn't think was so clear. Our archive had become another contested site in a culture war with ethics at its heart. Why tell this twisted and rather recursive story? Well, recursion is, th this is the home of recursion, if there was one. I, I think, what is, uh, we heard about closure and, and, and recursion? Partly because you were one of the few communities that would appreciate something I hadn't until then, and that is that archives are contested and that the ethics of their curation is important. This may be an extreme case, but it raises some of the questions that I want to apply to other projects, and I think we need to be uh, investigating together. It, in particular, raises questions that I think are important to the digital turn in the humanities, which, when I got started in humanities computing, everyone thought I was, you know, humanities computing was a little bit like humanities pencils. It was going to come, and it was going to go, and yeah, we need somebody who knew how to sharpen pencils. And then the web came along. So some of the reasons uh, why this case study is useful. First, we were uh, scraping and archiving current materials uh, of people, in our case, living and identifiable people. Most humanists uh, think they're safely dealing with uh, a past, and therefore, there's no ethical problem. We need to ask again who owns information and what it means to have consent. Second, the Gamergate community had claimed that the issue was about ethics, not only of the games media, but also about uh, also the academic game studies community <coughs> itself. The archive itself, if you will, was telling us that ethics was central to, uh, to its study. Thirdly, much of the materials we gathered are toxic and the community does harass researchers, which raises questions about the gathering itself and especially how to take care of ourselves as we uh, did the archiving, in particular the graduate students who are involved in this project. And finally, this project makes clear how academics like us are using the techniques of surveillance in the human sciences. We used to think of surveillance as something that governments and corporations do, but after Snowden, we realized that it is the less visible forms of surveillance, not the, not the cameras, not the phone tabs, but the surveillance of data that matters. And that anyone who is digitizing and gathering digital data on any scale is potentially con contributing to the problem. How should we think through the building of crafted digital collections to avoid the sins we accuse others of? So my first of uh, a number of theses today is that we, especially in the humanities, are at a moment, a turn in how we think about knowledge. This, by the way, is uh, Larch Valley. It may be cold in Alberta, but we have larches. Uh, this is like a week ago, and I did make it up the hill. <clears throat> if any of you have been there, you know it's a long, steep climb, and then poof. We can no longer treat the accumulation of data as a good thing. Just as after Hiroshima, we began to think differently about progress in science. More is not necessarily more. Information is not necessarily used for good, even by us. And big data is definitely being used in unanticipated ways. That's the point of it. Information should not want to be free. Part of the ethical problem is that information capture and digitization technologies are collapsing the archival accessioning process by automating the capture, enrichment, and depositing of information. 
You can almost do it all right from your camera without thinking for a moment about what you're doing. And poof, your daughter is up on the web in some form of archive, never to be taken down. There's no time for an archival function between researchers and repositories like ERA, the University of Alberta's Education and Research Archive that I have access to. In fact, very convenient access to. I am my own archivist now because the infrastructure has been designed to be open and convenient and not to forget. We therefore all have to learn to think about the ethics of what is captured and make accessible uh, and, and what we make accessible as archivists have. We have to learn from the disciplines that take respectful care of knowledge, the archivists, the editors, the librarians. To impact the issues, I'm gonna take what appears to be a digression. I'm gonna actually, since I come from philosophy, take a philosophical look at the assumptions behind mass capture, the assumptions behind this idea that more is good. And I'm gonna survey some arguments both for uh, uh, access and datafication, and then some arguments against it. One way to think of the issue is to think, is to ask whether something should be digitized and made available as an archive at all. Something that seems to get asked less and less with the proliferation of technologies and the compression of time to archive. As we speed up the time to archiving and shift responsibility, we're losing the moment to ask about what we digitize or not. These choices get lost in the technological decisions about how to digitize and the promises of what will, of what will be when everything is in the big, big archive. We're fascinated by the possibilities for digital work, digital research, but don't ask whether they should be a separate decision-making function that asks the question in the first place. And this is actually a common story in technology. Some of you are probably going, oh yeah, Phaedrus, Plato's Phaedrus. There is a, a crucial little story of the invention of writing, if you will, one of the first information technologies in which Socrates points out that there is the person who builds the technology isn't always the best one to decide how it's going to be used, and there should be a legislative function. There's somebody taking responsibilities to go to ask again and again, how should this be used? Sorry. So let's look again at information, uh, the information digitized in its will. And I'm, gonna, I'm sort of building around this, 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 uh, uh, this phrase, information wants to be free, because it, it's a sort of a, a marker of a certain way of thinking about this. It's a commonplace in the culture of information technology that information should be free. But do we really understand what it means? John Katz, in an article for Wired titled The Birth of a Digital Nation, argued that the single dominant ethic in this community is that information wants to be free. Somehow, the desire of information has become an ethic for an entire community. A rather ab alarming abdication of responsibility. What about our desires? Do we know what we want or what we don't know? So, I'm now going to sort of go through some of the, the uh, what I think are the, some of the underlying arguments for uh, and against uh, freedom of information. The first goes back to the 1946 UN General Assembly Resolution 59, which states that freedom of information is a fundamental human right and is the touchstone of all, free, all the freedoms to which the United Nations is consecrated. Freedom of information is often discussed in a political context as important to a democracy where it is a right to information by and about government. Without in accurate information about government and elected officials, it's hard to hold them accountable and hard to vote in an informed, decision, uh, in an informed fashion. Though I think the current American election shows that <laughs> you can have access to all sorts of uh, truthiness and it doesn't seem to make any difference. Uh, freedom of information is therefore essential to the transparency and accountability that are characteristic of functioning democracies. And it should be noted that freedom of information is not an argument for the freedom of all information. It is primarily an argument for information uh, important to democratic citizenship. Freedom of expression is another right, and it's a right uh, closely tied to freedom of information and because it would mean little if people didn't have the right to seek out and hear what others have to say. You know, if, they, if they're not allowed to express themselves, then it, 
then it's very hard for others to, to find out what they're saying. So Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media uh, and regardless of frontiers. The rights of free expression and information do not, however, mean that all information wants to be free nor that one can express oneself in whatever way one wants. There are still slander laws and restrictions on expression like copyright. Further, these rights assume that those who express information actually want to share it widely. So they, you know, freedom of expression means freedom if you want to express yourself, not freedom to have your information uh, sucked up and made available to everybody else. Access to information is another formulation and it's one of the principles of librarianship and archiving. The IFLA Code of Ethics for Librarians and Other Information Workers states in its preamble that the need to share ideas and information has grown more important with increasing complexity of society, blah, blah, blah. And then it goes on to say the role of information institutions and professionals, including libraries and librarians in modern society, is to support the optimization of the recording and representation of information and to provide access to it. The code goes on to connect this belief to the recognition of information rights, which are then grounded in Article 19 of the, uh, of the Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, note that this language of belief and role is in the preamble to the code, laying out the founding beliefs of the profession. Article 1 of the code goes on to state, the core mission of librarians and other information workers is to ensure access to information for all for personal development, education, cultural enrichment, leisure, economic activity, and informed participation in and the enhancement of democracy. It also says that librarians and other information workers reject the denial and restriction of access of information and ideas, most particularly through censorship. Later in Article 3, there's actually a discussion of privacy. But other than that, there's, there's very little recognition that the ethics of digitization and access might be more complicated than sharing as much as possible except when it comes to personal information. This is very much a modernist view of, you know, there's, this is good except for privacy. I actually don't think this maps onto what the archivists and librarians I know do. They think very long and hard about what is good, you know, what they're, what they're gonna put up, what the cost of putting it up, who's involved, and so on like that. So I find it rather strange. Maybe this is something that's being revisited. Finally, and most, uh, perhaps, uh, the most influential of the ideas, at least in contemporary technological culture, is the idea of free software. And uh, I, I need to mention that free software is one of those warm and fuzzy ideas. Um, I would have shown a kitten, but I'm, a, I, I'm an old dog sort of person. Uh, free, as defined by the Free Software Foundation, uh, is software that gives you, the user, the freedom to share, study, and modify it. We call this free software because the user is free, not the software. The Free Software Foundation goes to great uh, pains to explain that free does not mean you don't have to pay for it. It's just that you can do what you want once you have paid for it or once you have uh, legitimate access to it. This contrasts to a looser notion of open source software, which is usually code that is made available for free and which others can adapt without payment. And for our purposes, what matters in the related ideas is the assumption that accessible and adaptable code is a good. Whether it is free or open, there's an admirable, if unquestioned, ethic of sharing as a good that is woven into the rhetoric of hacker culture. Take, for example, Eric S. Raymond's first directive on how to become a hacker. Uh, no, I'm just going to read that to you. Write open source software. That's his first directive. The first and most central and most traditional uh, is to write programs, I'm still quoting him, that other hackers think are fun or useful and give the program sources away to the whole hacker culture to use. This is an ethic of sharing that proposes a gift economy of code sharing. The hacker community imagined by Raymond is an ideal built upon open sharing as a particular type of information, of, of a particular type of information, namely software code. 
The utopian community stands in contrast to the reality of commercial software, where most code is not free or open in any sense. The other free and open is the big, bad, multinational, multinational corporation. And who wants to be big and bad instead of warm and fuzzy? Well, he's not that fuzzy, but warm anyway. He probably smells a bit too. But this, by the way, is a, I think this is an arcade in Milan. Like many utopian ideals, the imagined hacker community is influential as an idea even if it's only partially realized. What happens less often among those committed to being hackers is a critical examination of the ethical idea upon which the community is based. Access to free code is the idea upon which community is built, not around which it is negotiated. Having looked at some of the principled uh, formulations, I want to now return to the curious formulation of information wants to be free. According to Roger Clark's website on the phrase, this truism or battle cry was coined by Stuart Brand in a discussion at the first hackers conference in the fall of 1984. It went on to be printed in different places, including Brand's book, The Media Lab, Inventing the Future at MIT. It is interesting that in the original formulation, Brand contrasted the desire of information to be free with a balancing desire to be expensive because it's so valuable. Brand at least recognized the power of the market for information. What is compelling to the formulation is the agency attributed to information that it wants. What does it mean for something to want? One reading of the desire is that there's something in the very form of information that communicates the desire for access. We could say that, the, uh, that when the given data, the etymological roots of data is given, uh, is formed into information, it is by design meant to be gathered, distributed, and accessed. That this is one meeting of the form and information. We could go further, Pache McLuhan, and argue that the message of the form of information is promiscuous access. This is even more true of digital information where the digital form certainly makes it easy to copy and distribute, as if there were no material, temporal, or spatial uh, constraints. Think of all the, the hype of the 1990s, you know, where we've gone from atoms to bits, and it's now completely free. There, there's, there's no material constraint to, to this. Digital information is the culmination of thousands of years of human ingenuity aimed at designing information infrastructure so that information can flow ever faster, ever more accessibly, and ever more resistant to censorship. Baked into this technological history is the utopian belief that if we could design information to want to be totally free and to therefore avoid all censorship, that we ourselves might be finally free and wise and good. This is the technological history with politics, even if hidden. And why do I say hidden? I say hidden because it's the nature of infrastructure to be transparent. Infrastructure are like glasses. You're supposed to look through them. This makes infrastructure particularly good at, uh, in some sense, hiding in plain view politics that are rather simplistic, um, or at least uh, are not defended uh, because the, the infrastructure in some sense encodes them as already uh, a ground upon which other things are going to be defended. <clears throat> and it's this infrastructure built over time that bears the desire. And by infrastructure, I mean not just the hardware, but the organization's roles and training. And we in the humanities bear much of the responsibility for this design, as we're the ones who wanted infrastructure for historical surveillance. And you know, I could go off on a digression now about the birth of humanism in Renaissance Italy, but it was a, a, a turn from secular in, uh, religious institutions. The humanists were taking the archive back, in some sense, from the monks and building the first universities and uh, secular libraries. There is, however, a darker urgency to the desire of information that we need to confront, and that is the threat of technological determinism. There's a hint in this phrase that we can no longer control the movement of information because the juggernaut of technology has been freed. The image is the runaway train of technology that can no longer be stopped and now just must be trusted the way we're supposed to trust the invisible hand of the market. And providence has long been the crutch of those who don't want to take any responsibility. 
This theme of already determined outcomes often accompanies calls for utopia. Think of Wired magazine. You, you know, on the one hand, this is going to be great. On the other hand, you can't stop it. The steamroller, the, the steamroller has left the station, just to, to mix metaphors there. <laughs> the rhetoric of inevitability is common in the world of information technology, where inevitability is the dark companion of the bright hype. Get with the program or be flattened by whatever steamroller technology has just been announced. And of course, there is nothing inevitable. And information doesn't really want anything. It's people who say so, and people like us who critique the same. Which leads to my second thesis, that we should care about information. And to do so is to be honest that we're part of it, all of us. We're part of building it, maintaining it, curating it. We, the information workers, the scholars, the librarians, the archivists, the scientists, we're always choosing to care about information, especially when we pretend it isn't our job, as I think many humanists do, or that it's something inevitable, or it's baked into technology and has a will too powerful to resist. Now the question is whether we can take responsibility for that care. So that's the downer part. Now, now, we, now we start up. Uh, there are thankfully other stories also echoed in declarations of rights that tell of a different relationship with information. These stories question the very formulation of information and remind us that we sing and speak for reasons other than just distributing more and more data. It is to these stories that I will now turn. Uh, I'm going to skip over privacy. I think most of you have a, probably a good handle on privacy and, and, and the arguments around uh, uh, how privacy questions can actually open really interesting questions about who gets, to, who gets to gaze and decide what is data worth archiving. Aboriginal knowledge is a deeper challenge because it's an epistemology that rejects many of the Enlightenment assumptions of Western epistemology under which we are operating. Aboriginal knowledge is not one thing, and of course, uh, my attempt here to define it for use in this paper will, of course, reify it. Nonetheless, Aboriginal knowledge is in constant contact with Western research practices, and therefore various communities have developed statements of principle for discussion and for research encounters such as this. One such statement uh, you have here from the uh, First Nations uh, Ethics, First Nations Ethics Guide on Research uh, and Aboriginal Traditional Knowledge. One aspect of Aboriginal knowledge is to challenge our assumptions about what knowledge is. And some of these uh, assumptions that are challenged include the idea that knowledge is guaranteed through open sharing and testing. By contrast, Aboriginal knowledge is often guaranteed through traditions of telling, which are not open the way we think of openness. That knowledge can be chunked into discrete truths that can be tested independently through some scientific problem, uh, process or through grant programs. That knowledge should be tested at all, often in adversarial conditions or situations, the sort of battle between uh, ideas. That knowledge can be owned by a single person rather than a community over time and that consent can be given by a single person and not by a community over time. And I should add that Aboriginal communities are not the only ones challenging access to information they believe is theirs. Cults like Scientology that sell access to stories would be another example, one whose claims I'm not particularly sympathetic with, but they, they also sort of piggyback onto this sort of rhetoric. The point is that traditions of telling view the open archive skeptically. The open archive reduces the relationship of telling stories to a situation where all stories are information, and information is available to all whether or not they are ready. Another argument that, is, uh, that, that uh, many of us in the humanities are struggling with is the question of appropriation of voice. It's a more general critique of the assumptions behind projects that speak for others. Alcoff, uh, in, a, in an article from 1991-92, argues that we all have a social location, especially those of us who are academics. This location provides epistemic authority to our voice, authority that we ourselves should be questioning, but rarely do. 
As philosophers and social theorists, we are authorized by virtue of our academic positions to develop theories that express and encompass the ideas, needs, and goals of others. And I could add that we are authorized in some sense to create archives without really questioning what authority we, we were working under. Applying this critique to digitization, we're called to ask whether digitizing is a form of appropriation. By what authority do we digitize the culture of others, whether other contemporary cultures or those of the past? And Alcoff, for those who are interested, goes on to talk about some of the, the dangers of appropriation, but I, I'm guessing you're a community that has thought uh, quite a bit about this. In all fairness, Alcoff is well aware of the problems of delimiting identity and membership. One of the problems with the argument of appropriation of voice, it becomes very hard to figure out what, you know, what is the identity such that you have or do not have uh, a claim to be able to, to, to talk for and from a community. Uh, when you, when you, the philosophers like to sort of reduce this to, to absurd situations where I cannot even talk about myself in the morning uh, because I'm not the same person. Nonetheless, this is something that we have to pay attention to and care for. So, um, inevitably at this pa point in the paper, I'm going to be asked to present some form of solution, or at least to take you back to the Gamergate problem and talk about how we dealt with this. Um, and to be honest, to sort of paraphrase a recent book by Morozov, to save everything, click here, the folly of technological solutionism, to be honest, I don't think there are easy solutions, but instead that we can find solutions from within our own culture of dealing with information. In fact, I think the humanities have a lot to learn from you and the culture of uh, curation. So let me return to my, uh, my, case, uh, my case situation. Concerned with the, about, about the ethics of gathering materials about Gamergate, mostly Twitter materials, but also materials uh, from 4chan and 8chan, we prepared a first ethical statement, as I mentioned before, and put it up on the Dataverse and Network. To be honest, I thought, okay, I'm doing this the right way, I'm addressing the problem. Uh, we looked at the terms of service of Twitter, we looked at a number of ethical positions from, from the literature, uh, we wrote up this report, we decided, we decided where, where, where we stood, and that was it. We had the solution, the problem was over. Uh, I should, for those who are interested, at that point we had decided that we didn't want to permanently archive anything in a fashion uh, that would follow and embarrass people from uh, years from now. We were trying to develop a sort of uh, right uh, to be forgotten ethic where we could gather the materials but we did not expose it in a way that it could be searched or, or scraped by the, the big search engines and something like that. Uh, we also lightly anonymized various materials and shared mostly summary data. We then developed protocols for uh, protecting ourselves, especially graduate students. The ethics was now solved. What we didn't account for was, of course, that there were other stakeholders, especially those DIGRA researchers who were being investigated. At a meeting for a Shirk-funded research project on gaming, I was approached by one of these researchers who, while she agreed that an archive was important, admitted that she really wasn't keen on having all the toxic materials shared about DIGRA researchers on 4chan and 8chan being scraped and archived by us for all time. Now, for those of you who know 4chan and 8chan, you'll know this is a particularly virulently toxic environment where people deliberately, partly to keep people like us out, will combine offensive images as a, it's almost part of the culture to, to exclude by offense, and that includes uh, representations of children, and, and you can imagine that some of the DIGRA researchers, how their images uh, were recombined with uh, various texts and put up there. And you can imagine why they would not, despite their sympathy with the goals of archiving this phenomena, why they would not want for all time for these offensive images to be sort of written into the record and, and discovered over and over and over again, often with very little con uh, uh, context. This forced us to reopen the issue of the ethics, to seek out help, to ask if there was a better framework than our traditional sort of rationalist uh, enlightenment framework with which to think through the issues. And I'm going to end by sort of outlining uh, some of the uh, 
uh, what, what this framework, the framework that we're coming to looks like. And lo and behold, there, I'll just uh, skip that sort of transitions there. First of all, it sounds like a platitude, but we came, to the, we came to, the, to the point of view that rather than finding solutions, what we had to develop were conversations about ethics and that these conversations needed to take place early in projects and should never be closed. I say this as a platitude because it seems like everywhere people say, oh, we need to talk more. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I frankly don't have enough hours in the day to talk to everybody at the University of Alberta. So. Uh, let alone elsewhere. So, so I'm sometimes resistant for yet more calls for dialogue. Nonetheless, we became convinced that we had to bake into the very idea of, uh, the bake into our teaching and research practices an ethics of care. And an ethics of care is built around conversations and relationships. The ethics of care comes out of sort of feminist thought and is a reaction to rationalist uh, if you will, Western Enlightenment uh, ethics, which tend to place agency on the powerful individual. And the ethics of care instead focus on the relationships that we actually have. The ethical relationships we have are not those of a bunch of powerful male white academics. They're relationships with our children, our grandparents, aging people. And that's the approach that they, uh, the ethics of care recommends that you think about. You think about the relationships, you think about uh, where and who has power, and you try to develop ongoing dialogue around these relationships. And I've sort of summarized uh, where we ended up in this project. First of all, we need to think about ethics over and over again. We need to compare, uh, consider the paradigms and change the metaphors, the language we use. Along with having conversations, we need to confront the paradigms that structure the imagination and metaphors of knowledge generation. By and large, these are Cartesian ones of the independent and heroic genius entrepreneur innovating. The corresponding and usual ethical paradigm is that of the rational independent agent, something that simply doesn't fit the complexity of what we're dealing with in most situations. The complexity of teams of faculty, staff, graduate students, research subjects, we needed something better, and that's why we were drawn to words like bake and repair and care, as opposed to the words of the discourse of efficiency and innovation. Language is important, and by changing the language, I think we can actually challenge some of the uh, assumptions in, uh, in the information. Thirdly, we decided to focus on curation rather than digitization and to focus on relationships. This is a practice of care we recommend, uh, and it's a practice, of course, that you know much more about uh, than us. And I should mention we had a clear postdoc uh, with us who was working with us to think about what it meant, curation meant in this context. There is no escaping curation, and this was a point I made at the beginning. Even when you pre pretend you aren't doing it or are ignorant of it, we're all doing it now. We've all, in some sense, been forced to become archivists. Following Jonathan Franzen in his novel Purity, we'd say that the humanities, especially the digital humanities, offer more than raw digital access of the WikiLeaks sort. Our projects are about, you, uh, about using knowledge of context in the collation, condensation, and contextualization of what is digitized. And we need to reappropriate the importance of curation and choice, even if it has a problematic association with the curation of canons, at least in the humanities and a curation that can often exclude voices. We have to design into our pro uh, practices a respect for relationships, especially with those whose voices we are digitizing, who don't have access to the technology we have. And this is one of the points Alkoff makes, that often when you build an archive, you actually silence an archive. When we, using the massive and impressive technology that we have access to, I know many of you think you don't really have enough yet, but you know, talk to your colleagues in Italy, talk to your colleagues in Africa. When you create an, a, an archive about an Italian poet, to some extent you close the opportunity for the people in Italy to create one or people in, in another community to create one. And that leads to the last point, which is rights of return, that we need to think about how we return 
the information and its control to the communities. So how did this help us with our recursive ethics of archiving uh, of toxic material? Well, we've opened a number of dialogues. This conversation here, it's not yet a conversation. It could be said to be uh, one of them. To begin with, we deleted all the 4chan and 8chan material and stopped the scraper. It hurt. It broke my heart because I thought I could see research projects and grants stretching out into the sunset. Uh, but we just decided the materials were not valuable enough to justify archiving. Um, and the toxicity was, uh, and, and the care that we should be showing towards uh, the people who were affected and being uh, represented against their will uh, was reason enough to delete these materials. Instead, we decided to start curating an origins corpus of early documents that had to do with Gamergate. Uh, so this was a, cho a choice to make a decision ourselves and let it, instead of just letting the techno technology gather big, big, big data. Second, we've committed ourselves to trying to avoid identifying people in our research. When we report on Gamergate, we don't talk about the individuals. Those of you who know Gamergate know a lot of their names. We don't use their names. We want, to take a, we want to turn attention away from the individuals, especially people who are caught up in it without a lot of choice. Thirdly, we started a number of uh, controlled dialogues. I say controlled because we're very clear about who, we, who we're willing to talk to and who we aren't, but with researchers in the field and people in uh, library and information ethics. And finally, we've made a commitment to care for each other especially our graduate students, which at least for me is fairly new, to have to worry about the safety of a graduate student, to have to talk to uh, security about that. Needless to say, I'm no longer confident that I understand the ethics of the sort of work we do, which is why I welcome the chance to speak to you. Thank you very much. Now, this is usually the point where nobody asks me questions. <laughs> I'm counting on you. Nobody. No one's rushing to that microphone yet. It's a long way away, but you know, you need some exercise. I don't think it's on. Well, while that's happening, I want to mention, by the way, that this is, this is work that I've been doing with a colleague, uh, Bettina Berent, who's a data scientist in Europe. Uh, this uh, this uh, paper that we are writing together is, is a companion to, we wrote a paper addressed to the AI community around ethics and AI. So, and, and so in effect, this is, we're, we're trying to speak to both communities. That's one of the, the dialogues. And that's why I've got her name up here, because she really is a co-author of this. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, many of the issues you raised are, in fact, intimately familiar to the community from which I come, which is archivists. So I'm interested to hear them being presented by a non-archivist to a non-archival audience uh, through a certain degree of remove. Um, and I wondered if you could speak to one thing in particular. Um, Gamergate was an interesting place to situate your, your critique. Uh, but to me, I think the central ethics of accession issue in Canada right now is the TRC process, which was predicated on and depended entirely on records collected for heinously monstrous purposes uh, to effectively administer people's lives in a directly malicious way. But through that collection, we ended up with evidence that we were able to use in pursuing some modicum of healing and justice for people. And I wondered if you could speak to how you would situate that sort of phenomenon in this uh, ethics of care as presented here. I would begin by agreeing completely with you that right at this point, 
uh, those archives. I think they're at uh, Winnipeg, and though they're, they're, Winnipeg is sharing parts, as I understand it, with other universities. And, and there have been even lawsuits about what is kept and what isn't kept are, are probably the most important archives that, that nationally. I decided to focus on Gamergate because I decided the moment you start speaking about ethics, you should start by throwing stones at yourself. So I just, you know, it was a dis decision that if I'm going to address people about ethics, I do not want to get on a, a, a pulpit. I want to start with where I know I have struggled and in some cases failed. So that was simply a tactical decision as Bettina and I try to, uh, try to tackle this. Uh, it also has that advantage, that recursive advantage, that the Gamergate community are studying us, and it raises issues. Which I'd love to explore more with you know, should one archive archives about you created by others, and 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 it raises the the level to which these archives become. It makes it very clear how they are contested, and how the the authority of who gets to archive can make a real difference to the long-term perception. Uh, and humanists have, I think, known that and, and taken advantage of that. And to some extent, I think the gamer gators know it too, which is why they're building their own counter archive. Uh, but I, I agree completely. So uh, at the Kuhl Institute, working with the library at the University of Alberta has um, We've recently started a, uh, la last year was the first year, we started a thing that we call craft grants, create and research archives for tomorrow, small f. I'm of the iPhone generation, I like to have small letters in my acronyms. Um, which is designed to fund people creating, uh, uh, prototyping digital archives, but they have to do it with the library, with the digital initiatives group, and we have some of you are here. They have to do it uh, after consulting with, with people, going through Chuck Humphrey's DMP stuff. And, uh, and we've, uh, after, after the recommendations of the TRC, we've actually made it a policy that we are gonna try to, uh, we're gonna, to some extent, prioritize proposals in all the cool institutes grants. We have the craft grants, we have team grants, we have cluster grants, uh, we're, we're gonna prioritize uh, what the TRC recommendation 65 says, uh, research around reconciliation, which is a little bit different than research around that archiving that's happening in Winnipeg, but it is the, the broader issue that I think we all have to address. The University of Alberta certainly is addressing this in various ways and struggling to understand how we can indigenize the community. I'm sure all of you are facing similar things at your universities. Forgive me for hogging the mic one more time. I, I'm, I'm still wanting you to speak specifically to the tension between the ethic of care and the ethic of collection on one hand and the ethic of evidence and accountability on the other. So my understanding of the court case, and I, I probably don't have the understanding that you have, is that the, they collected a lot of, there was the public testimony and then there was the private testimony. Uh, I, I think, the understanding that I'm sympathetic with is that the private testimony was collected for the purpose of um, developing the recommenda recommendations. It was not the people uh, were not, it, it was not necessarily explained to them or did, they did not understand that this would be archived. So I'm sympathetic with the idea that uh, those materials should be deleted, especially where people uh, ask that they be deleted. I think we have enough materials, even in just the public archive. I went to, when it came to Edmonton, I went and listened, there's enough materials. Uh, and, the, and the churches have been trying to pull together their materials and return them to the community uh, in, in various ways. So I, I don't know if that's, uh, it's a recognition of the tension. Uh, and, but I'm gonna say that in my case, I think caring for the, the communities that have suffered is more important than the long-term record. And we have more than enough information about what happened. Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, it's not the case that if these materials are deleted, we will uh, lose any memory of what happened. So that, that, that's where I would stand on it. And, and I would say this is a dialogue in which I'm not really one of the major players. I would say it's a dialogue that people in Winnipeg need to be having with various organizations that represent the different communities. I think there was a gentleman over here who wanted to ask a question. I think it was a great uh, presentation. I just, uh, related to the gentleman that was just up here, it's, uh, I thought that was a wonderful presentation on the uh, archives, but just a quick question, like, concern I had from yesterday's, uh, should we be any information that we gather over the years, should it be changed at all for, to, to go up with modern times, like uh, descriptions and things like that, or should we, should it be annotated uh, and keeping, the original thoughts and expressions of um, could be catalogers or archivists from where their expressions would be now considered maybe uh, offensive, but uh, should they be, rather than changing the data, should we actually keep it and, like I say, annotate it and make, uh, uh, make just the changes that we, in what we think they should mean? Uh, that's, that's the only question. Well, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, and I'm still struggling with the, the last one. Uh, the, the, um, Preserving information involves change. I mean, it's just you know trying to maintain the files and uh, the file formats change and so on like that. I think there's a level to which um, preservation is not a static process. Uh, I'm trying to remember the formulation of the Interpares project, but it was something to the effect of what we're really preserving is almost the, perform the performance of returning something that is uh, in a recognizable relationship with the past. Uh, you know, you, we could use the, the computer term rendering. We, we've got to preserve the ability to render something that we can understand how that has evolved. Now, when it comes to things like annotation, um, uh, you know, I, I guess I would begin by asserting the importance of the curation that you do, the importance of that question that you're asking, because this is stuff that, you know, at least, at least in my world and the humanities, theory has been king or queen. And the care work of editors, translators, all, all the people who don't have high-end French philosophy theory behind them has been, to some extent, delegitimized. So I want to, I, I want to say, this is an interesting question, and it is, this is part of a family of questions that are important right now because we are making a transition to large-scale data uh, archiving, if you will. And I don't mean an archiving in the formal sense, but, but a lot of these systems uh, will preserve data for a long time in distorted forms. So I, I would assert the importance of having the conversations. So then you have to ask, you know, I'm, I'm thinking you have a, you know, if we think of the bone libraries, when I was at the University of Toronto, I don't know if it's still there, but hidden away there was a bone library. They sort of knew that they shouldn't have that bone library. So they had sort of hidden it, and I stumbled across it. Um, I know in Australia, these bone libraries, they are now trying to, they're trying to start, you know, they, they, there's a lot of information associated with it. These things were used for years for teaching. Uh, in some sense, we need to preserve the history of how these Bone, and you know these were bones of Aboriginal peoples dug up and sort of sold off in various ways and documented in various ways. Uh, so they're trying to balance, on the one hand, keeping a memory of that while still returning the bones to the communities. And uh, so I think there are ways forward to preserve a memory of our practices while also updating them so that they're more nuanced and more respectful. <laughs> 